This podcast is brought to you by Audible, the world's leading source of audiobooks. If you would like to support it, go to audibletrial.com forward slash Sam Harris. Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Okay, well, I have a few stray points to address before I get started. The response to my initial thoughts about the Apple FBI controversy was fairly crazy. Uh, That turned out to be a much bigger story than it was when I recorded that last podcast. If I had waited a few days, I would have had a better sense of just how heated a controversy I was wading into. Uh, Now, first, I should say that many of you in the process of telling me what an idiot I am, say rather nice things like you usually agree with everything I say and you find areas of disagreement even more valuable. You say you love this podcast because it makes you think and in ways that you don't always find comfortable. And that discomfort is what you value most in the end. Now, I love that. Okay, that, That's great. If I push your opinions around and some of them don't budge, perhaps they didn't need to. You might be right and I might be wrong. That's why I talk about these things. I'm trying to reason in public. I don't have all my ideas worked out in advance. And as I thought I made clear about the Apple FBI controversy, I was presenting my gut reaction on this topic and also waiting for more information to come in. And more information has come in. In fact, many of you sent me some very good articles and emails. And some argue that there are practical impediments to Apple's complying with the government's request that I hadn't heard about. So I I still don't know what I think about this specific case. And it could be that the mere existence of strong encryption is going to make many of these concerns moot, which is to say there will be impregnable zones of privacy whether we like it or not. It's a little bit like what 3D printing might do to hopes of gun control. If If you can print a fully functioning gun at home, having merely downloaded a file from the Internet, well, then the genie just might be out of the bottle forever. But I'd like to make a few general observations in response to those of you who are absolutely sure that Apple shouldn't cooperate with the government in any way. And you're absolutely sure that this isn't a complicated issue, ethically speaking. Because I've heard from many of you, you are the same people who have no doubt that Edward Snowden is a hero, pure and simple, because you think his contribution to the welfare of humanity is unambiguous and entirely good. Now, Whether you know it or not, you are part of a new religion. And I'm going to give you a name for it, which you should feel free to use. You are part of the cult of privacy. And once again, I'm not minimizing the problem of information security. Let me say that again. I am not minimizing the problem of information security. But if you believe that your texts and emails and photos and medical records and browser history are so precious and sensitive that no human purpose could justify their being viewed by others without your consent. No court order, no reasonable suspicion could justify government intrusion into your privacy. You are a devotee of this new faith. Now, obviously, there are governments that are evil. In fact, some of the most persuasive things said in defense of Apple is that their complying with the FBI's demands would set a precedent that would put political dissidents at risk in the Middle East and in countries like China. And it's true that we could imagine our own government one day taking an evil turn. Many of you have written asking me, would I want a Ted Cruz or Sarah Palin administration reading all of our emails? Obviously not. What are you suggesting? That Tim Cook The CEO of Apple is the appropriate last line of defense against theocracy and tyranny in the United States? Is that really what you're picturing? What I'm hearing from many of you is a total lack of trust in government and in any conceivable judicial process that would produce a search warrant. And all I can say is that this attitude is toxic, and it's a problem that has to be solved. If you think our government is that broken, well, then you should come up with a plan to fix it. But the idea that no government should be able to execute a search warrant with respect to data on a smartphone because the FBI is the enemy, 
the NSA is the enemy, the Supreme Court is the enemy, the state is the enemy. That is pure paranoia and dogmatism and a recipe for anarchy. I really feel like I'm witnessing the birth of a new religion without the, the supernatural elements. And it's as boring and irrational and as blind to real questions of human well-being as the old religions are. The public conversation we should be having at this point is about how and when our government, our legal institutions run by elected representatives, should have access to our private information. And if your answer is never, no matter what, you are a child and a child priest of this new faith. I'm hearing from people who, in order to protect their sacred safe space inside their smartphone, they are willing to extend perfect privacy to known members of Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. If you're one of these people, I hope you understand how irrelevant you've made yourself to the crucial project of maintaining the integrity of open societies like our own. Some of you apparently want the government to have no tools whatsoever with which to combat the threat of nuclear terrorism, for instance, because your privacy is just so important. But you'll post pictures of yourself half-naked on Instagram and let corporations track your every move. Well, let me make one prediction. However we resolve the challenges of information security, there's going to be some legal process whereby governments can spy on us or publicly demand our data. When the totality of threats in the 21st century is understood by rational adults, some role for government intrusion into our affairs, some legal process, whether overt or covert, some way of scrutinizing the behavior of dangerous people will remain necessary and inevitable. And if you doubt that, don't send those precious emails of yours to me. Send them to Edward Snowden. He will love them. Okay. Well, I got that off my chest. Unfortunately, this podcast just gets more uncomfortable from here. I'm serious. Maryam Namazi is an Iranian-born atheist, a secularist, and a human rights activist. She's a spokesperson for a variety of organizations, for FITNA, a woman's liberation movement, for Equal Rights Now, for the One Law for All campaign, which is against Sharia law in Britain, and for the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. She hosts a weekly television program in Persian and English called Bread and Roses, which is broadcast in Iran and in the Middle East via New Channel TV. And she and I talked today about accusations of bigotry among secularists, profiling, the migration crisis in Europe, all topics that are well known to build rapport between podcast hosts and their guests. And um, I make a few comments at the end of this, but um, all I can say is that this conversation struck me as more difficult than it needed to be. I hope one day to be better at having conversations of this sort. But for the moment, what you hear is what you get. So I'm here with Miriam Namazi. Miriam, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Listen, before we get into all the things we have to talk about, and we really have a lot to talk about, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? I, that many will know who you are, and I will have introduced you briefly before we started here, but what's your background and what is it exactly that you, you do? I'm an Iranian-born political activist. I guess that's the best way to describe it. I um, am very much on the left as well, and uh, I'm a campaigner for women's rights, for secularism against Islam and Islamism. So I've started various campaigns and organizations around that. But for me, I think fundamentally, there are different campaigns that all sort of come to the point of defending human beings, citizenship rights, irrespective of very often false identities. And when did you leave Iran? In uh, I left Iran in 1980. So um, when we left, uh, it was um, a year after the Islamic regime took over from the Iranian revolution, which wasn't originally uh, uh, an Islamic revolution. And then we went to India for two years because um, that was the only place we could manage to get into. We, we came to Britain for a year, but we weren't allowed to stay. So my family, uh, we actually moved to the U.S. 
Hmm. And uh, my parents still live in Yonkers, New York. <laughs> but hmm. I've been here in Britain since 2000 now. And so did you leave Iran under duress? I mean, were you fleeing theocracy or was there, was, there, was there some other motive to leave at that point? Yeah, well, it, originally my mom brought me out to India just to put me in school because the schools were shut down for a while in order for the government to Islamicize things. And um, uh, we ended up not returning my father um, and my three-year-old sister at the time. They had stayed back in Iran thinking my mom would go back. But things just got so bad that my father uh, told us to just wait in India. And then he joined us when he was able to get out. Mm. And, and are your parents religious or do they share your views at this point? My parents are uh, Muslim. My dad uh, was brought up in a very strict um, Muslim household. So his father, who's, which is my grandfather, was an Islamic scholar uh, who taught Arabic uh, and um, issued fatwas and that sort of thing. So he grew up in a very strict uh, family background. But um, he met my mom, who was a Christian. She was a Protestant. Uh, in India, they got married. My mom converted to Islam, so they're both Muslims, but uh, it was never a strict Muslim upbringing. Uh, to be honest, I didn't really know I was Muslim or knew mm. much about Islam until I was faced with an Islamic regime in Iran. So I went to a mixed school. I never had to veil. I wasn't treated differently because I was a girl. Right. So uh, I just want to inform our listeners about the, the proximate cause of this conversation, because I've followed your work, uh, I guess, really just in the form of seeing some videos of you um, encountering people trying to no-platform you. I mean, this, this happened recently, and, and we'll get into this, because you've, you've received more of this than, than uh, most people. Um, but the, the proximate cause of this conversation is that I noticed you recently calling my views about profiling bigoted. And... Um, also, I recently had, had Douglas Murray on my podcast uh, where we discussed the migration crisis in Europe, and I believe you've called his views on this topic bigoted. At the very least, you, you forwarded this open letter that was written to me by the blogger Ina, uh, which said as much. I mean, I, I, I'm, there may be not perfect overlap between your position and hers, but and we can get into that. But you know, Ina didn't quite call Douglas a bigot. At least she distinguished him from people who she thinks are true bigots, like Donald Trump. But um, she put him on a, a spectrum of bigotry in which um, she said he, quote, otherizes and generalizes regarding Muslims. And if I'm not mistaken, you didn't quite call me a bigot either. At least I think you clarified that by email. But you thought that my views about profiling are bigoted or close enough to be troublesome. And I don't want us to dive into those issues yet. I want us to talk about some other things we agree about. But I just want to know if that's a fair characterization of where we're starting out. Um, well, I, I wouldn't say they're fair because I think, uh, you know, uh, maybe something that will make it more uh, understandable, my, my perspective of things is, you know, uh, and something that most probably a lot of your listeners will be able to understand better, possibly, where I'm coming from, is uh, we all know about the regressive left, you know, and I say this as someone who's firmly, very, very firmly on the left, uh, who uh, very often... Um, you know, promote and legitimize and normalize the Islamist narrative of things. So they will basically see, um, you know, any criticism of Islam or Islamism as bigotry against Muslims because Islamists often feign to represent Muslims and uh, they see it as a defense of the Muslim minority. Um, so, you know, there are, you know, for example, student unions, people very much who consider themselves progressive on the left, who will call me Islamophobic, who will no platform me. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's very clear to possibly your listeners that I would say that they are promoting an Islamist narrative. That doesn't mean they're jihadis. That doesn't mean they are going to decapitate anyone. That doesn't mean that they are, um, you know, um, defenders of a khalifa or Sharia law, 
but they are normalizing and promoting the Islamist narrative, which means that, you know, uh, they're, they're sort of giving it some sort of legitimacy uh, that, that doesn't make them Islamists. Mm. And my argument with regards, you know, the arguments that Douglas Murray makes, um, you know, Tommy Robinson, obviously they're on a continuum. I wouldn't call Douglas Murray a bigot or a fascist. I wouldn't call you that either. But my argument is that when we or sec sections of atheists normalize or justify or encourage um, certain narratives, it does promote a far right narrative, which is a narrative that places collective blame, that promotes bigotry against people. That doesn't mean that anyone who promotes the far right narrative is necessarily a bigot or a racist. So I think it's similar to how anyone who promotes the Islamist narrative is not necessarily a fascist. Uh, but there is that narrative that concerns me as someone who is both a vehement opponent of Islam and Islamism, but also uh, a, a strong uh, you know, um, defender of human beings irrespective of their identities and beliefs. Mm. As I said, I think we we should wait to get into the specifics here, but I, I just, I guess I want to say up front that I consider these instances of friendly fire where I where I hear you criticize someone like Douglas or, I, or you know, Ina does it, friendly fire being a, a case where the people on the same side of, of, in this case, a very important concern about Islamism are inadvertently mistaking one another for the enemy. And it's not to say that our positions might not be different. In fact, you know, I think you and I will probably disagree about what makes sense from a security point of view and, and the details of immigration policy. Uh, and I think that'll be interesting. But I, I think we can have this discussion without allegations of bigotry being the summary of uh, the position you, you disagree with. And I, I feel like I've noticed you and Ina, and maybe other people are doing this as well, but I feel like you and Ina pull the trigger on accusations of bigotry fairly early, and it's uh, it strikes me as pretty counterproductive because I you know I really do not think Douglas is at all bigoted, and that's not to say that I'm going to get you to agree with his views about immigration, but they're not coming from a place of having some animosity against brown-skinned people or Middle Eastern people or people from other cultures. He's quite worried about theocracy and intolerance. And again, well, I, I want to table a detailed discussion about immigration for a few minutes. But uh, I sure, just, but I, if I can just yeah, come just in yeah, that, feel, yeah, feel free to react to that. I just feel like yeah. it's. I mean, so so just w w one more aspect to this here is that I, I recognize I'm worried about the problem of bigotry, and I'm worried about this conflation of a criticism of ideas, in this case, Islamism, uh, with an actual hatred of Muslims as people. So you know, Douglas and I and many others are in the unfortunate circumstance of being surrounded by real bigots. You know, but be, the, you know, there are people on the far right who occasionally make the same reasonable noises about the threat of Islamism that we do. And then they also say, obviously, other things that aren't reasonable, and, that, and they express genuine religious hatred or racial hatred or blind nationalism or some other ideology that I would want nothing to do with. But given a shortage of time, it isn't always easy to determine who is who. And so I find myself in the strange position of hearing someone make sense on the topic of Islam, but this person has come to me with their reputation pre-stigmatized by people like you. You've called them a bigot, let's say Tommy Robinson or Mark Stein. And these are people who, you know, I, I'm not especially familiar with. I haven't read, if they have books, I haven't read their books. I, I've just seen them give a speech. Um, and I'll give you an example of this. So, for instance, Tommy Robinson just did an interview with Dave Rubin where he made sense, really perfect sense, for an hour and did not say a single bigoted thing. Right now, I'm not very familiar with Tommy Robinson. I, I, don't, I don't live in the UK. And... I just know that he is under the shadow of more or less constant accusations of racism and bigotry. And yet I hear him speak for an hour, and even when pressed on the topic of past associations with bigots, he made perfect sense and talked about how he left the EDL 
because of those racist elements that came into it. So can I say something now? Please. Um, I mean, there's a lot of points you've raised. And, um, you know, on, on the issue of friendly fire and the fact that we're all on the same side, well, I disagree. I disagree not not to say that you and I are not on the same side or, you know, but, but I think that uh, being on the same side is takes a lot more than just saying that there are people who speak a lot of sense about Islam or Islamism and therefore we're on the same side. We might disagree on certain details. And the example I always give is, uh, for example, I'm against U.S. militarism uh, in certain parts of the world. Um, and the Iranian regime uh, also thinks the U.S. government is the big Satan. And therefore, because I'm opposed to U.S. militarism, I should side with the Iranian regime. And a lot of left actually do this. There are people on the left who, are, who have these blinders of anti-imperialism. All they see is anti-imperialism. And they're willing to side with, you know, the Islamist fascists just because they're anti-imperialist. They'll side with anyone. And from my perspective, you know, your enemy's enemy is not necessarily your friend. And, uh, you know... The you know the decades work I've done in campaigning, I think my track record is clear, is that I've worked with lots of people, and not people who are left like myself, communists like myself. I mean, I, I think I, I hardly work with people who think like me, uh, but I work with lots of different types of people, and I'm open to that. I think when you're building movements, mass movements, where you need to challenge something as outrageous as the Islamist movement, that is wreaking havoc you know, the country where I was born, in the region I come from, and across the world, you know, they're ba it's basically a killing machine. It's destroying lives, dehumanizing um, women, children, men, you know. When you look at it that way, uh, then obviously you want to have as many allies as possible. Uh, but, but I do draw the line with the far right, because I think, you know, it, it's not just Islam and Islamism that's the problem for me. Uh, in the same way that, um, you know, uh, I, I, the example I gave, it's not just enough to be anti-U.S. militarism. I mean, I know you'll find a lot of people on the left, what, you know, is being called the regressive left, what I call the postmodernist left, mm. who will say that Islamists make a lot of sense. They'll talk about discrimination that uh, minorities face in, in the West. They'll talk about, you know, uh, the attacks on of uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, government or the British government on uh, the war on Iraq. And they'll make a lot of sense. And they do speak some truths, even Islamists do, you know. But the problem is these are half-truths. They are only part of the whole story. And I think it, it is a grave mistake to think that Tommy Robinson's criticism of Islam and Islamism is something that's commendable because he says similar things to what you and I say. I, I, I disagree fundamentally. And, and I think this is an issue for me that is key because I am not only anti-Islam, I am not only anti-Islamism, I am not only anti-jihadism and Sharia law and the Iranian regime. I am also pro-secularism. I am also against religion's role in the state, including Christianity's role. Anglicanism, as Douglas Murray makes out, is not some cuddly, you know, lovely uh, religion and Britain is so much better off than the US. We still have parliament in this country bishops are in the house of lords they have not been elected there you have the queen who is the representative of the church uh, who heads this country religion has a sinister role in this country as well sure. the fact that it's cuddlier is because of its uh, the fact that an enlightenment has pushed it back that has challenged it that has questioned it sure but i don't so, i don't think I, douglas would disagree with that i mean i, I just think i see where you've well, gone here but let, it, let's not make this i don't know why we're making this about douglas murray well no that's yeah. not Ina sent you a letter you you can interview her and talk to her about it my uh, you know i don't spend my days advocating advocating against douglas murray my problem is with the far right with the edl with pegida with stop islamization of europe with uh, movements with political movements that are not individuals, but with political movements that I think are collect placing collective blame and harming the, the, the overall yeah, No, no I, I got that. I got they, that. They dehumanize people um, all the time. So, but I also want to say one other thing, and this is this thing about bigotry. Uh, I think we need to also be very careful, and there is a danger here that seems to be happening, is that 
uh, bigotry is then being trivialized because there are false accusations of bigotry. And trust me, I've had them much more than you possibly might have. Uh, you know, I'm not only called an Islamophobe, but I'm also a coconut. I'm a native informant. Uh, I'm also a rape apologist because I defend, uh, you know, I, I say we shouldn't blame all migrants for what happens in Colm. Uh, I'm also called a... Um, undercover jihadi because I oppose double Islamization of Euro America mm -hmm. and Europe. That's something that Robert Spencer has called me. I'm an anti-Semite because I oppose the Israeli occupation of Palestine, though I defend the right of Israel to exist. And I'm also for the rights of Palestinians and Israelis to live in peace. Uh, what, what I want to say that there are lots of accusations, but to hide behind those and then say that, you know, you know, uh, raising an issue of bigotry, then trivializing it when bigotry is a, a huge issue for many of us doesn't really help either you know and I think um, for me it's very clear I, I'm I don't have to read anybody's books to know where they stand on the political spectrum I have been in politics for uh, several decades now you know for me it's very clear if you promote uh, our culture our civilization you know uh, versus the others, you know, the barbarians, the savages. That is a politics that is um, otherizing, that is generalizing, uh, you know, the other, and that sees the other as the barbarian and savage, where, whereas that's not the case. We have so many secularists and free thinkers and a tsunami of atheism in our region, in the Middle East, in North Africa and South Asia. Right. Uh, you know, and oftentimes this, this, the, the, the talk about migrants even, you know, the storming of migrants as if it's an act of war rather than people fleeing for their lives. Many, many of them fleeing the, the Islamists uh, that, that uh, so many are against. But when it comes to their victims, uh, people have very little sympathy, it seems. Okay, well, um, but, but so so you're, you're, you're alleging, okay. But no, it, but it, it, it is more complex, and that's why the accusation of exactly. bigotry is so unhelpful here. So I listen. I, you know, I can't, I can't own everything that Tommy Robinson has said because I, I'm unaware of much of what he said. But we're we're having this conversation because I noticed you calling me a bigot, and you, you sort of walk that back a little bit. But I didn't um, walk it back. I'm sorry. I didn't walk it back uh, because what I said is that it promotes the far right narrative. It promotes a narrative of bigotry. And as I explained before, when I call, when I tell the regressive left that they are promoting an Islamist narrative, it doesn't mean that they're Islamists or fascists. You can say it's promoting it, but that doesn't mean that it actually is promoting it. In fact, I criticize the far right well, course, as much opinion, as anybody. Though, Sam, that's your opinion. What I want to say is that we don't agree. We don't agree on certain things, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, you know. It, it, and and no, the but thing there, is but there I, is I'm something, to... Miriam. But there is there is something wrong with characterizing this disagreement in terms that demonize, or to use your phrase, otherize the other person in such a way as to make conversation and reasonable alliances impossible. I mean, friendly fire is a problem. What you're saying is it's not really so friendly. It's, a, it's legitimate fire against people who you're also opposed to or views you're also opposed to. But I think you're actually misunderstanding these views in important respects. So, for instance, obviously, Miriam, I'm not arguing that the enemy of your enemy is, by definition, your friend. And I just think that's the, a false analogy. And I can so I'll, let's forget about Douglas. Let's forget about Tommy Robinson. I can only talk with authority about my own views. But what I witnessed happen here is that I use a term like profiling. Now, and profiling is a word like torture, right? It's, I mean, to use it in for any purpose other than to declare one's horror and rejection of it brands you as dangerously right-wing in most circles, and certainly in your circle. I don't think you actually understand what I mean by profiling, and I think we'll get into that, but I'm just saying is that when you go after me as someone who is irredeemable for using the word profiling, or, or to say that to, to use this word is to make common cause with right-wing bigots, by definition, one, it's unhelpful, but two, it's just untrue, right? It's just, I mean, there, there's absolutely nothing in my view about profiling or about security in general or about immigration, and again, we'll get into the details, that is an expression of my bigotry against Muslims, 
against people from the Middle East, against other cultures. I mean, there's none of that. There's not a shred of that. And yet you're responding to it as though there were. And that's what I'm finding so unhelpful. Well, um, you know, Sam, the thing is that um, it might be unhelpful to you. I mean, I think this, this is a thing for me. Um, bigotry is an important issue. I, I'm not saying it's not for you. Uh, I didn't mean it that way. But w what I'm saying is that it is a, a very important matter for me uh, because um, you, you do often find in a situation that I'm in that you have people on the far right trying to use ex-Muslims, trying to use our criticism of Islam as a way of scapegoating Muslims and immigrants and migrants, refugees. And so uh, it puts me in a very difficult position because I do feel that I'm constantly having to fight on several fronts in order to be able to put my message forward. You are fighting on several fronts, but I notice you starting these fights unnecessarily, as you did with you, me. You might think you, you you might think it's unnecessary, Sam. I'm sorry, but for me, it is an integral part of the fight against Islam and Islamism because I think that um, you know if this fight means that uh, bigotry becomes normalized, that it is easy to dehumanize migrants and Muslims, place collective blame on them, then I don't think it helps our, our movement, you know. And so for me, I feel it, it is as important to fight against uh, racism and bigotry as it is to fight against Islam and Islamism. Well, of, co now, of course it is, you know, I mean, but, but, okay, but you're acting so, like I disagree so, with you. Uh, well, I don't know if you're disagreeing with me, but it's it's very difficult for me to have my conversation because you're not letting me finish uh, what I have to say. So if you'll just be patient um, and let me try to explain my position, and it would be great if you could try to understand my position as well. Uh, now, the thing is that it, I'm not coming after you. I, I think this is a bit of a, you know, I'm not uh, coming after you, but I am making comments, as all political people do, on uh, positions that I disagree with, you know. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, you have come out and uh, you've just said right now that you think there's nothing wrong with to what Tommy Robinson said for the, for the hour that you heard him speak. I have a different position on Tommy Robinson, and, you know, I also have a right to express it. Now, even in this country, for example, UKIP, which is a right-wing political party, um, they, for example, have prescribed... Uh, they don't allow their members to also be members of the English Defence League, of the British National Party. So even there are fa there are right wing parties who consider these groups off the scale and don't want to be associated with them. So it's not you know unnatural for me to criticize. You know it's not me being you know overly uh, sensitive and throwing out the bigot card at at any opportunity. Uh, it's a real concern about the English Defence League. If you look at Tommy Robinson, he didn't leave the English Defence League because he was concerned about the fascist elements in that. Uh, uh, in that group, he has continued to uh, praise and defend the EDL until today. And if you look at his speeches at Pegida rallies, for example, he says that he didn't, he realized that it was too soon, the EDL was too soon for Europe. Well, but well no, that, that's not actually what I heard EDL, him say. I, I want to clarify my that. My perspective on it, Sam, I'm sorry. Okay, well, uh, but I, know, I just to say... that Tommy has such a wonderful defender uh, from no, no, uh, you know, listen, on your part. No, no, it's not but, that, I, I, Miriam, that's not fair. This is just a single example of a person who I'm actually not very familiar with, who I know Well, then came... maybe you should listen to me because I'm more familiar no, because, with him. You, but you're not no, no, characterizing just, the view okay. he expressed in this interview. Did but, you see his interview you know, with Dave Rubin? It does. It doesn't matter. A lot of listen. A lot of Islamists will come and tell you that Islam is a religion of peace. I'm sorry, you cannot judge political movements by, you know, Bush telling you that he's gone to Iraq because he wants to liberate women. It's not enough. I'm sorry, you know, it, you you have Gra to. That's look fully. At I fully grant. Movements. I fully grant that Sam, point. I'm sorry, it's impossible to have a conversation because you constantly interrupt me. I let you speak for five, ten minutes, and I, I don't want it to be the sort of adverse discussion because we're not really going to get anywhere and it's just 
we're not going to reach an understanding. And I, even if we don't agree, I would like us to be able to at least understand the other person's position. Do you okay. know what I mean? I, I totally understand so, what you mean, but I but, don't yeah. want I don't want you to assume a disagreement where there isn't one. And when I interrupt but, you, it's because you're not letting but, me speak, and no, you keep saying but 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 there is a disagreement. No, 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 Miriam, Ma Miriam, <laughs> I'm interrupting you when you are attacking me for a view or or criticizing a view I don't have. About Tommy Robinson. Okay, uh, but. I don't know why you take it personally when I criticize. I'm not. I'm not taking it personally. I just don't want us to be wasting our time or our listeners' time. That's but that's it's it. It's not a waste of time because isn't this the whole reason why we're having this discussion? Because there are differences of opinion. No. Well, yeah, but I. But atheists, we haven't actually um, gotten to those differences of opinion. Listen, I will not. I will let you say whatever you want to say. My job is not to interrupt you, but I do have a job to try to get our conversation on track and. I'm noticing it go off track, and you're assuming that I have far more affinity for Tommy Robinson than I, in fact, do. And when you summarize his view as being, in fact, opposite of, of the only interview I've ever heard him give, then I, 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 can't, I can't sign off on the dotted line there and say, yes, that's the Tommy Robinson I was just defending, okay? In the interview with Dave Rubin, he explained why he left the EDL, and it was, in fact, because he noticed racist elements join it, and he couldn't be associated with it. So... If it may, he maybe he's lying, I don't know, but that is the Tommy Robinson I was defending, however tepidly. Again, I don't even want to talk about Tommy Robinson. I was just using him as an example of someone who's come to me pre-stigmatized and who then expresses views that make sense. And I'm just I'm in the position of not knowing who is who here, and all I can speak about with authority are my views, and I notice that the same kind of thing is being done to me, and that and that is what I'm finding unhelpful. But again, this well, is Sam, this is Sam, not even Sam, the, Sam, meant we, to we be are the. Not, we are not victims here. Uh, there are many people who come to my to me, pre-stigmatized as well. I, you know, well that's life. That's politics. The fact of the matter is that we all make statements. And we will have people supporting it, criticizing it, and we need to either defend it or, uh, and so on and so forth. So I, I think, you know, you know, s starting a conversation about how one is stigmatized or, you know, how they come into a conversation with people having prejudgment of them. Well, that exists in every, you know, for everyone and every movement. Uh, what we can do is to try to clarify our positions and to try to, um, uh, make clear w why we say certain things and why we are opposed to certain things and why we defend certain things. And th that might be the most helpful way to go about it. But, you know, the fact that we're pre-stigmatized, well, everybody is, you know. It's unfortunate that uh, there are accusations of bigotry that are untrue. As I've said before, I have been accused of it many times myself. But I, I would say that it worries me when, because of this sort of false accusations of bigotry, that bigotry now seems to be trivialized now. And the minute you do actually talk about politics, which are bigoted, which are placing collective blame, that suddenly, you know, you get this sort of um, a fight pushback saying, well, you know, everything is pre-stigmatized and, uh, you know, the accusation of bigotry doesn't wash anymore. And, you know, uh, whereas it is a real concern for a lot of people. And it's important to be able to still say it and also to call out when it is false, but also to recognize that there are movements, political movements that are promoting um, uh, positions against Sharia and Islam in order to scapegoat uh, vulnerable minorities as well as uh, migrants. And that's the p position that I come from, that, you know, for me, I want to fight against Islam and Islamism while at the same time making sure that that fight is not used to scapegoat against people who are people like anyone else and they have different views and values and cultures amongst them it's not one mass you know uh, it's not I, I don't prescribe to the clash of civilizations sort of thesis where it's us versus them I think there are many of us uh, across borders and boundaries uh, believers and non uh, and uh, others who are on an opposing side so I think that's Okay, well, you know. let's talk about the details, and it seems to me we have two 
topics that are related. I mean, they're, they're basically the same topic, but they show up differently in our conversation about these issues. One is profiling and the other is immigration. And I, and I view them very much the same way. But let's talk about them. Let's, let's start with profiling and what I've said about profiling and what you think about it, because clearly you think my views about profiling lead to a kind of collective punishment, collective blame, give energy to the bigots of the world, and and I, I just think that's that's untrue. So let, let's we'll talk about that, and then we'll talk about immigration, uh, and then let's just assume as you know the, the, in the background for those who aren't familiar with your work, we are having this fraught conversation against a background of considerable agreement about. The problem of Islamism, the problem of uh, theocracy in the Muslim world, East and West, the intolerance born of that, the, the problem of the regressive left uh, becoming apologists for all that. So we, we agree probably across the board on those points, but now we're talking about how the West should respond to these security concerns and, you know, at airports. Uh, with the security apparatus of a state or at it, at the borders of states. So just, um, I mean, briefly on profiling. Now, again, profiling is this dirty word, and, uh, you know, I, I don't think it should be, but I, it, it inherits all the baggage of other ugly words like pedophilia or bestiality or torture. And so the moment you seem to be giving a, a sympathetic construal of this word, you, you have a lot of work to do. But in my view, okay, you know, all profiling is, is to use some statistically relevant information in one's self-defense. And to be against profiling across the board, to be against profiling of any kind, is to be against using any relevant information to solve one's security problem. So, for instance, you know, being against all profiling in intelligence gathering out in the world is to say that we should spend equal time scrutinizing the Amish or the Anglicans as we should members of the Muslim community, or indeed of the Muslim Brotherhood or Al-Qaeda, because to focus on Muslims at all, or even any specific group of Muslims, is profiling. And so I've just put that to you. It's, wouldn't it be irrational when looking for suicidal terrorists who are planning to target civilians, say, to spend equal attention on all religious communities at this point? Well, I mean, I, you know, for, for me, I think, uh, why should the marker be even the idea of the fact that the, these people are characterized only as Muslims? People have a million characteristics that define them and that they define themselves by. Uh, just to give you an example, you know, if you look at those who've carried out terrorist attacks, for example, and we're only talking about here in the West, terrorist attacks take place every day in the Middle East, North Africa and South Asia, and we hardly get to hear about them. Uh, but you could say, for example, that um, it is their main char characteristic the fact that they're Muslim? Is it that they are university educated? You know, Tommy Robinson talks about the jihadis from Luton. Is it something specific to do with Luton? I think you can pick out any one of these things and if you want to say that this is the reason why these things happen for me i think it's not necessarily that they're muslim that it's happening it's not necessarily that they're refugees or migrants or university educated but it is their political stance that determines that they are jihadis and terrorists and it comes to behavior rather than the fact that they're brown or that they're muslim or that they come from Iran or Iraq or where ha what have you. Because as I said, you know, uh, not all Muslims think the same, it just as not all Christians think the same, you know, and that uh, just like every, you know, not necessarily every white male represents value, also not every brown Muslim represents Sharia values. And so I think there is that danger with profiling. Profiling is an ugly word because I think it is ugly, you know, in the sense of um, the fact that it is seen to be, you know, profiling of blacks, for example, in America, it does have that history to it. Profiling Muslims, it, it does raise those very same connotations. And I think, I think there are some security experts that would agree with me as well that you need to profile behavior rather than one's race or religion and so on and so forth. Yes, profiling is often assumed has some racial component, and there is such a thing as racial profiling. There's absolutely nothing about 
my argument with respect to profiling for jihadists that considers race a relevant variable. In fact, it's, it would be a starkly misleading variable. So, it's, it's, so there's nothing racial about uh, what I recommend, but I just, I'm slightly mystified by uh, what you just said, because I mean, what percentage of jihadists do you think are Muslim? Uh, Sam, I, I think that is the wrong question. I'm sorry. You well, know, well, you might you might that, think it's wrong to yes, look for jihadists. Uh, uh, it, but... Yes, but but listen to me. I mean, the thing is that you know what percentage of Muslims are jihadists? Obviously, a large percentage. You know, even if they used to be Hindu or Christian, they are now converts and they have become Muslim, and so therefore a large percentage of jihadists are Muslims. Of course, there is a link with Islam. I'm not saying that there isn't. But what I'm saying is that you cannot just assume that because someone is Muslim, they are a jihadist. Well, of course not. And profiling, of course not. Exactly. So profiling Muslims does that. It there doesn't. This, it doesn't. I, but, well, 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 that's well, my perspective, oh, if oh, I can explain. But let, me just, oh, but let me just give can you I some more finish, details. Can I finish my sentence? But pl again, you're talking in vague generalities, and I want to but give I'm you specifics. Not, I'm, I'm trying to... I understand everything I say seems to be vague generalities to you, and everything you say seems to be on point. And, and I'm sorry I don't... I'm not able to express myself as well as you can. But what I'd like to say is that, you know, the, the point is that... Um, when you profile, I, I know there's this argument that Muslims are not a race, and therefore anything that targets Muslims is not racist and not racial because they're not a race. But the reality of it is that they are seen to be a minority. In the West, they are seen to be a minority religion, a minority group that is taking over a Christian Western Europe. And therefore, when you talk about the profiling of Muslims, even if there are also white Muslims, it does have those connotations, in my opinion. And as I've said before, profiling Muslims isn't going to help us fight terrorism. What we need to do is profile Islamists. And that, I think, is where behavior, well, the behavior of far-right uh, jihadis and Islamists, that's where we can manage to make inroads into this rather than conflate Islam, Muslims, and Islamists. I really think there's a misunderstanding at the bottom of this. You're, you're interpreting my interrupting you as hostile, but I keep detecting misunderstanding, and I just want to short-circuit it, and it, you know, we can do that over the course of five hours, or we can do it over the course of 90 minutes, and I'm, I'm just trying to, to use your time and our listeners' time efficiently. So, I mean, I, I think you're reading more hostility into my interruptions than is there, because there is none I'm, there. I'm not, reading I'm not reading hostility. I think there, there, is there is no misunderstanding. I think we just don't agree, and I no, think that's what the issue is. Just let me interrupt you a little bit more, because we— Please go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Because <laughs> um, when you say we need to profile f for Islamists, you could say we should profile for jihadists, right? Uh, the, the, the thing that I'm arguing for is that we need to admit that we know what we're looking for. If we admit we're looking for jihadists, and we admit that 100% of jihadists are Muslim, then the variable of being Muslim is more relevant in the search for jihadists than the variable of being Amish is. In fact, if we could be absolutely sure that a person is Amish, they suddenly become completely irrelevant with respect to the search for jihadists. Now, I will grant you that there are other problems in the world beyond jihadism. There are other forms of extremists. There are other forms of suicidal terrorists, even. And we're worried about them, too though not in the kinds of numbers we are with respect to jihadism now. But if you're looking for jihadists, let's say you, you work for the FBI, to not profile, to be committed to not profiling at any cost, to say we are going to be scrupulously fair, we are not going to single out Muslims in any respect. If you're working for the FBI, that means that every time you interview an imam at a mosque to look for any troubling signs of radicalism in his community, you will then be obliged to what? Interview the Mormon Tabernacle Choir to see if they've witnessed troubling signs of radicalism in their community? I mean, there's, you will be obliged to deliberately and consciously waste time in the service of not profiling. To, to, to go to a mosque is to profile for the variable of adherence to Islam to some degree. And you, you, what you seem to be saying initially is, that is unfair, it's otherizing, it's collective punishment. And now you suddenly tell me we, we should be profiling 
for Islamism. So I, I, I see a contradiction there, and I, I would love well, you to explain it. There is a it. contradiction, and that's, I think, what, what is fundamentally a problem here. When, when there is criticism of far-right movements and groups, uh, there is a, there, there's, that's a hugely different from uh, targeting individuals, believers, based on the very fact that they are believers. If you are part of a fascist movement, then your politics is very clear. Uh, if you are a, a believer, you can be a secularist, a feminist, you can be even an atheist, uh, you know, and you come from Muslim background. So there's a huge distinction between targeting uh, groups like the English Defense League, targeting Islamists, and I make very little distinction, um, as though others don't, between jihadis and Islamists. I see them as part of the same movement, doing different parts of mm -hmm. that movement, taking care of different aspects of that movement. The jihadis are the military wing, and the Islamists very often um, are, you know, promoting it politically and via various ways. Uh, so so to, to, to say if the terrorist attacks are taking place by a, a movement, by a political movement, a far-right political movement called Islamism, then targeting the behavior and profiling the behavior of those who are carrying out or susceptible to carrying out terrorist acts is very different to saying uh, one should profile anyone who is a Muslim because every jihadi is also Muslim. Uh, you know, yes, every jihadi is also uh, is also Muslim. That's not saying everything. It's not giving the whole truth. And for me, therefore, I think profiling should be done with regards to behavior and not placing collective blame. I have a huge problem with placing collective blame on populations just for the very fact that they were they are Muslims. You know, the reality is that people are born into a religion out of no choice of their own. The very fact that out of some misfortune of lottery, I was born in Iran and I have the label of Muslim on my forehead, you know, until the day I die, unless I make this very difficult decision to leave it and to publicly leave it. And even then, the far right will call me an undercover jihadi. What I'm saying is that, you know, people are much more than the religions of their birth. They, they've often had no choice to it. That choice, lack of choice, continues to follow them throughout their lives. And to profile them and to place collective blame on them and equate them with Islamists is not right. It's not fair. And it doesn't see the reality that Muslims are people like anybody else. They have a million different beliefs. Uh, and to, you know, um, sort of uh, homogenize them and see them as this one collective actually really hands them over to the Islamist movement. But, but no, and many but, of them are fighting it, fighting Islamism. But, but I'm not, do, but I'm not doing that. But, but, Mariam, I'm not doing that. I'm not and, saying you're doing... Okay, you're not doing that, Sam. I'm talking about what I think the problem with profiling and collective blame is. Okay, well, I, I'm, it's, yes. This is not a personal attack on you. I, I'm not I taking it personally. I'm, do, I'm just trying yeah. to... I'm attempting to express my views about security, in I, this I, case, so profiling. Yes, yeah, so am but, I. But I'm, you, I'm, I'm also concerned about security, Sam, you know. Uh, but, but, Mary, but, but, Mary, but so there's nothing. The only thing I've said about profiling comes out of my experience. And again, when, when I was talking about profiling initially, it, it was at the airports, right? So you're getting on planes and you see the kind of security theater where we see people who are obviously not jihadists, obviously have not been recruited, getting searched with the same kind of scrupulousness and intensity as people who you might worry could fit a reasonable profile of a jihadist. And my argument here is that we have to admit that we have a finite amount of attention. We have a, fi we have a finite amount of resources. And we should never deliberately waste our time. Now, there is a, a, a role for random searches here, which, which increases everyone's safety. And so randomness should be included. But what everyone has found galling, or many people have found galling, are obvious wastes of time knowing that our resources are limited. So again, so to take it out of the airport, as I tried to do a moment ago, if you're going to profile based entirely on behavior, which is I mean, behavioral profiling is, is certainly part of it, and I would agree with you, most of what you need to do is, is to profile on the basis of behavior, but adhering to a religion or to a a neo-Nazi organization or whatever your identity is, is a type of behavior, right? So if you're looking for jihadists, 
and you want to reach out to the community of people who might be aware of the jihadists in their midst, you're going to be reaching out to the Muslims. You're not going to be reaching out to the Mormons. And okay, so, can I explain? Can I explain this again to Sam, if you yeah. don't mind? There's a difference between a religious believer versus a neo-Nazi, and I think that's where you know that's my issue here. Is that of course when you said uh, you just said something about where you're going to a person who's religious or a neo-Nazi is very different. The 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 fact of the matter is that uh, for me, a neo-Nazi is like the Islamist. So yes, yes, I, think, I agree. You know, those who are part of a political movement have certain characteristics. Very often we see that the security are actually following people who then go on and commit crimes. Well, why haven't they acted more quickly? They shouldn't be waiting until we're at the gates of an airport uh, to, to be able to find who is, uh, you know, a willing and able to commit atrocities against the population at large. You know, you said something about, well, we should focus on those who are obviously Muslim. Well, who is that? You know, I went to the uh, U.S. Uh, with uh, my husband's uh, young son. He was 13 at the time. He was taken away and fingerprinted and questioned. He's born in Britain, but he looks, obviously, he must look Muslim to them. And, you know, uh, my husband now, he's, he's hasn't been to Iran for 40 years. We're opponents of the Iranian regime. He's been atheist for God knows how long. Uh, you know, he's got to apply for a visa now because he's uh, he's also considered an Iranian national, whereas the Iranian government is constantly threatening us with death. So what I want to say is that just because of the fact that we happen to be Muslims as well or seem to be Muslims, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that we are we should be more susceptible to profiling than someone who's Amish. Why should we? I have nothing to do with the Islamist movement. I hate the Islamist movement. The reason I'm here is because I fled it, because, and I've spent a lot of my life fighting it. So what I'm saying is that the, what profiling does is it places collective blame. For me, this is an important issue. What it says is that just because all jihadis are Muslims, therefore all Muslims are fair game. I disagree in the same way that you have a lot of white, uh, far-right um, terrorists in the U.S. You know, to argue, therefore, then, that every white male needs to be targeted because every, or every Christian, white male Christian needs to be targeted because in America, 100% of the white terrorists are Christian and they're white and they're male, misses the point. You well, know? But and it I doesn't. It doesn't necessarily easy. miss the point. So, for instance, I mean, if we had a global. It does because you, if you're going to spend putting pulling aside every white male at the airport. Uh, you're actually wasting security time. Well, Sam. Well, if you're of so course, you are. About the lack of resources, you should be actually, uh, you know, profiling Muslims is a waste of time. Well, no, it's a it, waste of time. Is it, just you, as pro you just said, every white you ju male is a waste of You time. just said you're for behavioral profiling. So I'm at, so so again, there's confusion creeping in here because we're talking about airports and then we're talking about intelligence in the world. And and I think not, the, the confusion quite... is that you think because someone is a Muslim, therefore that's a behavioral issue. And I'm saying it's not because what I'm saying is that people are more than the religions that they're born into. Religion of course they are. Experience. Of course they are. But if, if you're it's going to reach experience. out, if you're a government and you want to reach out to the community to find evidence of radicalism and dangerous behavior, what community are you going to reach out to? The Muslims. <laughs> you can say it that way. Uh, you seem to be saying, on the one hand, that that is collective punishment. If the FBI is, reaches Look, out Sam, to the Sam, Muslim community Sam. for help, that Sam, is... When, when the Israeli government um, places collective blame on every boy and man from, you know, every boy of 12 or whatever onwards is seen to be a terrorist, that is placing collective blame because there are many people who are not terrorists who are not with Hamas. Of course. Uh, what I'm that, saying is but, that it miss when you target entire groups of people based on, uh, you know, their beliefs, based on how they look, you're missing the point. If security is an issue, if Islamism is the problem, you know, is, start Islamism with is your a set of beliefs. Sorry, start with the U.S. government's relationship with the Saudi regime. If well, you're so I, concerned I agree about with you there. I, we Islamism. agree about that. Uh, what, but I'm just saying, you know, l let's not keep on focusing on targeting Muslims and migrants in that country. Start discussing the U.S. government's relationship with with Saudi Arabia. Well, listen, you're going to no. get you're going to get no argument from Some, me on that point. But 
No, uh, I know I'm not. But again, there's still co- uh, Mariam, you're still uh, I feel like I'm getting sprayed with a fire hose here of misunderstanding. You're not I'm misunderstanding Sam. We're disagreeing. We're not disagreeing. Fine. We're not we're not disagreeing because on <laughs> I the think one we are. on the one hand, you, on the one hand you are advocating behavioral profiling, right? But then when when I go to talk about what that entails, you push back uh, reflexively against the the so-called collective punishment of behavioral profiling. What do you mean by behavioral profiling? Let me explain, because when you say behavioral, I think you mean, uh, well, because they're Muslims, that's a behavior, that's a, you know, and, and therefore um, they're fair game to, to be profiled. And what I'm saying is that, no, because religion is a lived experience, people live it in a million different ways. Uh, if we want to actually not waste the security's time, uh, you know, it, it would be best that they target this far-right movement and separate it from people who also happen to be Muslim. Okay, so again, specifics here. So I work for the FBI, and I I have eight hours today that I can use to make the problem of jihadism and Islamism more generally go away. So I I have a, a checklist of things I could do. I could interview the Amish. I could interview the imam at the local mosque. Or, you should interview the ambassador of the Saudi embassy. Okay, well, that, that's that. <laughs> I should also do that. I agree, and I could interview the imam at a mosque that is uh, well known to be a Salafi mosque, right? Well, obviously, so, then so, you're targeting Islamists. You're not targeting Muslims. That's the difference. Okay, but, yeah? but of course, everyone in that mosque will say that I'm targeting Muslims, right? This is profiling. I'm not targeting the Amish. Right, I'm ignoring the Amish. Is it ethically okay to ignore the Amish in my search for jihadists? Listen, I think, Sam, what's happened is uh, there's a confusion here between individuals and political movements. Yeah, If you profile individuals, uh, there's a problem there. If you profile or target movements, mosques, Islamic organizations, this is a different matter. But they're filled with individuals. Profile- they're filled with individuals yeah. who will feel targeted as individuals. Look, I think that this is a conversation that we sort of need to wrap up because we're not going to reach an understanding. No, I, I think here. we're just actually I, getting to the, really, the basis for no, understanding. No, yes. I don't think so. I think that the fact is that when uh, there's a question of racial profiling, for example, or Muslim profiling, I, I see them very much as being the same. Uh, you're talking about targeting groups of individuals. When I talk about collective blame, it is about human beings, not about political movements. You can make collective judgment and decisions on political movements, on uh, whether they are left, whether they are right, whether they are far right. We can do that because we're talking about movements. We're talking about organizations, states, uh, uh, you know, uh, certain mosques, uh, certain jihadi okay, groups. But, but what does that mean? So, so, so a certain very, mosques... Very, Different, so very, there's a, very so there's a different. mosque in my community that is well known to be a, a, a Salafi mosque. mosque. Is not the same as profiling Muslim Sam. It, okay, but the, I show up okay. at the mosque. I'm a member of the FBI. I show up and I talk to the imam and I want to know if he's noticed any radicalism in his community. And he says, "Listen, I feel profiled here because you've come to a mosque simply because we're a mosque." And this is totally illegitimate. This is collective well, then you blame. Have to, you have to show why you're there, right? You're not there because you're profiling Muslims. Of course, I'm, I'm profiling uh, Salafi Muslims in this case. You're there because, you know, you know, Salafi Muslims is like saying, you know, the far right fascist Christians. Well, y- you can't make the Christians and the fascist far right and neo Nazis are two different things in the same way that Muslims and Islamists are two different things. Uh, so I think targeting Islamists profiling if you if you'd like to use that word uh, uh, profiling islamists and jihadis is very different from po- profiling muslims and that's where my point of contention is okay well that's when that... you profile muslims or christians or whatever iranians or anything of that nature you are placing collective blame when you profile political movements and those who are affiliated with jihad jihadis with Islamism, with the Christian far right, what have you, uh, that's a very different thing. But wait Behavioral a minute. Behavioral and political uh, sort of um, uh, analysis of things rather than, you know, 
uh, let's just find the first Muslim we can and see. Uh, Miriam, now this is really a distinction, I think, without a difference. We're still that's talking about. That's obvious, Sam. That's obvious. We're talking about vast numbers. No, no, but we're but, talking but about vast that's numbers where of the people. Point of contention is. Again, I, we, we're disagreeing about the disagreement, which is frustrating. Just think of how this plays out in detail. So. If you think, if have, you th Sam, Sam, I think we have. Mariam, um, if you think it's legitimate to profile Salafi anything? Muslims, then someone who's dressed like a Salafi in the airport, who's declaring his his or her allegiance, if you're wearing the nik niqab in the airport, you're declaring your ideology well, with your dress. Right? I, I I agree that the niqab is a flag of the Islamist movement, but not necessarily everyone wearing a niqab is an Islamist. Some come from countries where it is part of it is enforced. Of course, of course, they're, they're being forced to wear it, and so yes. on and so forth. Exactly. So, you know, I, I think we should move on from this discussion. I think we we can see where our differences lie. I, I honestly um, can't, Miriam. I honestly well, can't. I, uh, you're just you're just saying that there are 1.6 billion Muslims who should not be collectively punished, but there's some subset of those Muslims, literally hundreds of millions of them, who, by your definition can be collectively punished for let's say the bombing of a um, abortion clinic uh, let's say uh, profiling all christians because of christian right movements targeting uh, you know uh, planned parenthood clinics or it is targeting the christian right that's the distinction I make one is targeting a religious right-wing movement that is um, killing that is uh, whatever um, you know um, trying to uh, promote one form of terrorism or the other versus uh, just ordinary believers and I think that okay, but, it is a dangerous in, thing to target ordinary but believers. Mariam, Mariam there is no bright line between ordinary and extraordinary. There is there is, well, there is a there is it's a not. It, it can't even be drawn at the niqab, as you, by your estimation, right? It, there is no. There simply is cannot, no bright line here. You cannot profile people based on how they dress because I, I, I would. I would agree with you in general. Okay, yes, so but you agree. But, so but, but the point. That's where but, it's wrong. No. Okay, but you're you're saying that there are people. I mean, so the Christian right in the U.S. is fully thirty percent of the U.S. population, right? We're talking about a hundred million people. Right. So, so you're saying it's okay if we had a Christian right fascist movement that we had to get more information about. It would be okay to focus on the hundred, the reservoir of a hundred million people who could have some greater knowledge of that movement, and ignore the two hundred million people who probably have no knowledge of that movement. And that is profiling. That's also, by your definition, collective punishment. Right. It's so, not. It's not collective punishment because they are uh, adherents to a political movement. It's very different. It's like challenging Nazism. It's like challenging the KKK. It's very different than from challenging those but, who are but German it's a, it's, or those it, or putting all Japanese in some sort of camp. Uh, it's a very different thing. You know, uh, uh, it, it, it's it's challenging uh, rather than blaming all Japanese, all Germans, all Muslims, all Christians. It is targeting. Okay, but it's not nobody's blaming groups. all of anybody and again to bring well, that's this what back profiling does Sam Definitely, well, that is what in my opinion finally listen does. I mean to bring us back to lived experience so listen I was just traveling with Majid Nawaz in in Australia and we took three plane flights together so we went through I had the pleasure of going through security with him three separate times in airports and he is on the record as being against profiling I'm on the record as being for profiling under some construal. We talk about this while going through security, right? Now, my view of profiling is actually what I call anti-profiling, which is, which is actually just not wasting time, obviously, right? So acknowledging that we know what we're looking for. And there are situations where, you know, I, I'm going through the airport and fully 50% of the people I see, I can rule out at a glance as there being a zero probability that they have been recruited by a jihadist organization. Now, the totality of those intuitions can be captured under what you're calling behavioral profiling. That's fine. It's certainly not racial profiling. It has nothing to do with race. And so going through security with Majid, we're talking about this, and I, and I say, okay, look, look at that family over there. Would you be willing to get on the plane 
knowing that they did not pass through security? Would you, be, would you be willing to bet your life and the life of everyone else on the plane that this is not a jihadist family preparing in the next hour to blow themselves up and blow their children up? Can you get the whole gestalt here based on how they look, what they're doing? And he and I reached total agreement in real well, time. You, you did, but if I was there on the plane with you, I won't have agreed. Uh, now, now I, I think that the issue is, um, wh what do we do now, Sam? It's 7.30, <laughs> and we've only talked about profiling, and well, I think I, the I, positions are well, clear. We're just rehashing old stuff. No, they're, they're, they're actually not so clear, but let's, let's move on to yeah. immigration. We'll, 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 we'll get into the weeds in a similar way. People really want us to talk about immigration. You've been very outspoken on what you call an open borders policy, and you have alleged, at least that's how it seemed to me, that anything less than an open borders policy is a kind of collective punishment or bigotry or a, a, a just a shocking lack of compassion for people who are who are fleeing the war-torn areas of the world. So I just want you to, to just explain what your position is on, on immigration and, and the migrant crisis in Europe. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think, uh, yes, I, I promote open borders because I think that it is important for people who are fleeing, um, you know, let's say if you look at the top five refugee producing countries, you know, if you look at any of them, Syria is the first one, you know, you can see the reasons why people are fleeing. It's they're being barrel bombed by the Assad regime. They have um, ISIS on one hand. They're being bombed by Russian forces on the other. It's the reactionary groups fighting uh, there as well. Uh, so it makes perfect sense. If any of us lived in those societies, we would most probably also want to flee. As you know, if you look at what's happening in Syria, 470,000 people have been killed. Um, that's 11.5% of the population has been injured or, or been killed. Life expectancy has been dropped to 55.4 years. 45% have moved. Uh, 4 million of them have fled the country, 6.3 million are internally displaced. So if you look at the, those huge numbers, you know, I think, uh, oh my goodness, what, what's the least we can do, you know, to sort of help people who are fleeing those awful conditions? And I think none of us disagree with the fact that it is awful. Mm -hmm. It would be to open borders. I think when borders are closed and people are languishing behind them, in mountains, for example, in trying to get into Turkey behind barbed wires, you know, it it it, it is um, uh, something that I think is is horrendous. You know, we should be opening our borders. I think there's a mis misunderstanding here, though, that people think that because I'm pro open borders, it means that it's a free for all. No, it it means that people are processed legally as well, uh, that they are interviewed, as uh, is always the case. There is no distinction between the processing that takes place in America and that which takes place in Europe. There, it's the same. I've been involved in refugee resettlement work. For example, I worked in the Sudan for two years with the U.S. Refugee Resettlement Office, resettling people into the United States. I've also dealt with the asylum procedures, both in the U.S. as well as here in Britain. The procedures are very similar. They're based on the 1951 Refugee Convention and the 67 Protocol. You know, many of them are processed by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees if it's in countries bordering usually the countries that they're fleeing from. And then there's asylum procedures within each country, like the US has its own procedures, Europe has, each country has their own, but they're basically based on the UN Convention and Protocol pertaining to refugees. So open borders doesn't mean it's a free-for-all. Obviously, well, you know, uh, asylum is not a right for those who are war criminals, those who have killed, those who have committed genocide. That is part of the refugee protocol as well. And therefore, you know, if someone is guilty, if someone has committed a crime, they need to be prosecuted, they need to be jailed. Um, but nonetheless, that doesn't mean that people who are fleeing for their lives shouldn't have uh, protection, shouldn't have some form of refuge. And I think that we have a responsibility to help people, um, you know, um, who are in more difficult circumstances than our own. Do you, sorry, do you make a distinction between political refugees who are fleeing political persecution and violence and more ordinary economic migrants who are just simply looking for a better life in the West? 
Well, you know, the, the, the U.S. asylum procedures in, in Europe, the UNHCR's guidelines, it says that a refugee is someone who has a well-founded fear of persecution, not only because of political opinion, but because of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group as well. And therefore, there are many reasons why people flee. For example, membership in a social group includes possibly atheists. It includes women who have faced honor crimes or FGM and so on and so forth, you know. Uh, so there are a myriad of reasons why people flee, not just political. Uh, you know, I, I, I do think, though, that this attempt at criticizing and making illegal people's flight, calling them bogus, uh, talking about the distinction between economic and political refugees. I mean, look at the situation in, in, in Syria. Let's look at the situation in Syria. Does anyone really think that there is any part of that country where people are oh, safe and having an... I don't think that's the criticism so, you're so getting. Think, so you're, the criticism... People... Marion, let me just get a few more facts on the table so you can react to them. I think the criticism you're getting is, one, the phrase open borders seems to signify that there is no vetting, first of all, and I, I think to... Well, of to... course there's vetting. Of course there's vetting. But... I've, I, I've worked in the refugee field for 15 years, and I've been involved in vetting. It's interesting that I think I'm the only one in many of these conversations that have been involved in vetting. Okay, but there but seems to be a... Open borders, look, separate from that fact, look, uh, it is about a basic human right. When I talk about the right for everyone to have an education, for an end to faith schools, for the right to food for everybody, irrespective of, you know, uh, where they live and how much money they have, these are huge maximalist, you know, human demands uh, that mm. uh, that are oftentimes unattainable, uh, impossible, possibly. They might even seem to be like dreams. But we need to always talk about the big ideas, the big dreams, in order to be able to have a little impact in people's lives. When I talk about open borders, it is about the fact that, look, there are people who are fleeing for their lives. They are fleeing for their lives. Uh, men, women, children who are, have, have gone through the most atrocious things, you know, and who are literally dying to reach safety. They are literally dying uh, in, our, in our seas, at, in mountains, at borders. So I'm, I'm calling for compassion. Yeah. As someone who um, is a, considers myself a human rights campaigner, I am saying that we should have compassion. We should open our borders. That doesn't mean that people shouldn't be processed. That doesn't mean that war criminals should be allowed in. Of course not. But, well, well Miriam, so I don't think there's that, anyone listening to this conversation who doesn't share your compassion for the people who are fleeing for their lives. Uh, well, I certainly great, share it. So we're on the same but, page. Okay, but there are other people we are talking about. There's the fact that in many cases, something like 80% of the people showing up, it's been reported, are men. And if, you, if, it was, if it was purely humanitarian, you would expect equal numbers, men and women and children, or some, some semblance of equality there. And they're coming not from Syria but from North Africa, you know, or Eritrea or other countries, and they're, they clearly fit the mold more of economic migrants. And I'm just asking you, do you want to differentiate there, or do you believe that the border should be open to all economic migrants as well? Uh, listen, I mean, uh, look, let, let's, let's be clear about the statistics. If you want real statistics and not what the far right says, you look at the statistics that the UN High Commissioner for Refugees uh, issues. They are the ones that give statistics globally on the numbers of refugees, where they come from, who they are, and so on and so forth. And um, it's very clear that 50% of Syrian refugees are children. Uh, it's equally divided between women and men, 50-50. Of course, um, uh, you have more, obviously, um, uh, this includes all the statistics. Sorry, this is what I want to say. Not just those entering Europe, but also those going to countries bordering Syria, for example. So, um, you know, and I find this interesting. What is this um, hatred of young men? I'm not uh, expressing it, hatred. I'm not, no, no, Miriam. Sam, I'm not saying. Please, please just answer. I, your time is limited Sam, and, our, and our, our patience I'm is not limited. Saying, I'm not saying you're saying that, but there is this sort of thing like, oh, if you're a young man, you should 
should go and fight and you should go and die and you don't have a right to you know refuge or safety and only women and children do why i would never i would case? never say such I a thing say, or oh think my it. Goodness, Sam, okay. i didn't say you said that i'm saying that, that there is this sort of attitude where oh well you know uh, uh you know, there, there, there are so many young men. Well, why don't they just stay back and fight? I didn't say you said that, but this is well, some of the arguments. But, but the only here. reason why, just and, to make it clear, Ma Miriam, I, I just have to clarify this. Miriam, the only reason why I raise the disparity between men and women is that it is a very common practice for working age men seeking better lives abroad, not asylum, but for economic reasons, to go first and then bring their families after them. And that all I'm asking you, I'm not even disparaging that project at all. I'm just asking you if your conception of open borders differentiates between seeking asylum and seeking a better life economically. Okay, so so let me say this. Um, I think that uh, if you UNHCR says that now there are equal numbers of women entering Europe as there are men. And I think part of the refugee flight is that oftentimes uh, families will stay at refugee camps while men try to reach safety and to see if the route is safe enough for their families to join them. Other times, of course, entire families come. So again, uh, there are reasons behind that. I think, again, also that Syria is not the only country where refugees are fleeing from. I think if someone from Iran flees because of the very nature of Sharia law, if you're gay, if you're a woman, if you're a dissenter, if you're a free thinker, that you wouldn't want to live there. Many people don't, that you would want to flee. I think it is impossible to distinguish between those who come for economic reasons and political reasons because if you look at the numbers coming they are coming from areas where there is either war or also theocracies and movements like Islamist movements where there's a lot of restrictions on people's rights and lives and therefore you know this dream of um, you know living somewhere safer better where you are freer is a dream we all have and i think if anything the migrant uh, crisis and the flight of refugees shows is that despite what cultural relativists say that actually people everywhere uh, you know want to live free and in a, in a sense that's why they all want to come to europe you know some people will say well why don't they just go to saudi arabia well i sure as hell don't want to go to saudi arabia and i think most people wouldn't want to go from syria into saudi arabia they prefer to come here and there's obvious reasons for that you know again i'm not even clear what your view is here so i just want to nail that down so you don't want to distinguish between asylum seekers and people who are migrating for other reasons economic or otherwise because all of this is knit together and they're just everyone is seeking a better life and they have a right to seek a better life in a global world where all, we're all just human beings i understand that but are you saying that there is no limitation on the number of people that the Europe or America or the West in general should accept into its borders. We should vet people for war crimes, but otherwise everyone should be able to immigrate anywhere they want to. Well, yeah, yes, Sam, I do think that. I mean, I also think faith schools should be banned. I also think that, you know, uh, we need secular societies everywhere. Uh, not, not many governments don't necessarily agree with me. Uh, many people don't necessarily agree with me, and that's fine. But these are the positions that I think are important to make. I think the fact of the matter is that, you know, people, we live in a world now, it's a global world, and it's very, very small and people move for a million different reasons. There are a lot of people moving out of Britain to Spain, to other countries, retiring there. In fact, until very recently, more people were leaving Britain than actually entering it. This is the reality. What, what uh, I, I find, what, you know, the fact that we never question the, the right of someone born and raised in Britain to move to Spain, that's their right. But you know, we question why someone from Iran would want to come to Britain. And I think, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, especially with the reality of the internet age and social media, the fact that now we are so close to each other, uh, you know, we feel the effects of Islamism here, uh, as do young people in, you know, Syria and Iran. They want to live um, a free life. 
and they have a right to. And I think whether they come for economic reasons, don't forget, and you know better than anyone, people living in the U.S. know better than anyone, that migrants' immigration is good for the economy. People want to work, they want to contribute, and immigrants generally, if you look at statistics anywhere, they bring in more than they take. Of course, they also put pressure on schools, on libraries, on hospitals, and that's not because necessarily uh, that we aren't able to cope with them, but it's because uh, very often governments put profit before human need, and they're not willing to put money in schools and education, and we're seeing that ourselves. You know, in Britain, every day our hospitals are closing, our libraries are closing. It's got nothing to do with migrants. That's just the way very often the system works. Uh, and so I think actually in general, migrants are good for our societies, particularly if you look at a lot of European societies. You know, it's an aging population. We need young people to pay for our pensions and for our retirement funds and uh, to fund our hospitals, to staff them, our schools, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. Okay, and so, so I think it's a very positive thing. You well, know, I would very, I would agree positive. with you. I would but agree can with you. I also just make one other comment too? Is that, uh, you know, for those of us who've worked in the refugee field, you if you know there are so many historical resonances with the attitude towards migrants in historically you know how jews for example were perceived in the us in in europe even the sort of anti jewish refugee propaganda at the time the fact that they were often accused of not being genuine the fact that they were often said that you know they they can never integrate into our societies uh, you know, uh, that's those sort of arguments. If you if you've actually, you know, when you work in the refugee field and you look at the history, you see that each wave of immigration or flight is met with the same sort of prejudices, the same sort of accusations uh, until a new set comes. And then it's it focuses on the new set of people, you know, and I think even, for example, you know, they'll say, oh, well, they don't speak English. Well, if you look at the immigration experience, you see that the first generations necessarily don't speak as well. The second generation, you know, are the, they act as a go-between between between the first generation and society, and then you've got the third generation completely integrated. So, I think we need to look at it in that way, but also to realize that we live in another world now. There is mass exoduses because of various reasons. That again, let's not forget also. Uh, some of our governments have a responsibility in creating. If you look at the situation in Syria, you've got, for example, the Iranian regime involved there. You've got the Russians involved there. The Turkish government is involved there. You've got the U.S. government, the British government. They are involved in various ways. And mm -hmm. therefore, you know, there is also uh, some um, level of accountability there, too. Um, nonetheless, I'm looking at it just from a human perspective. You know, for me, I think, you know, if we can feed everyone, we should do it. If we uh, protect people who need refuge, we should do it. Why not? What What is wrong with demanding open borders? Why is it seen to be such a despicable demand no, no, it's, when it's not... it is such a fundamentally human demand? Mario, I'm not saying Mario. you're saying that. I'm not saying you're saying that, but, you know, I have... Pegida people, uh, deputy leader of Pegida, you know, saying that I am promoting a rape culture because I'm defending open borders. Well, you know? but listen, and this, uh, is, this is their Mariam. propaganda. And so... Okay, but there's, um, pro there's propaganda on both sides. At the beginning of this conversation, you... Thank you for always reminding us of that, well, Sam. Again, this is the tr kind of thing I'm trying to rectify in talking with you, and I, and I, I don't know if it's going to be successful, but at the beginning of this conversation, you said something about any talk of defending one's culture and worry that your culture could be destroyed by immigration, uh, mass immigration, open borders, which is in fact the worry of someone like Douglas Murray, that that is tantamount to bigotry or, or energizes bigotry. And I think that is a, a needlessly polarizing and in fact inaccurate thing to say. And it's, it's not that there aren't bigots who speak in those terms, but yeah. it seems to me to be totally reasonable to worry what would happen if you just opened the borders. And you, you have to be willing to talk about it, right? So let me just say a few things about my concerns and you can react. And if you detect any bigotry here, please point it out. So I agree with you. We are trying to build a global civil society, and we have to get beyond nationalism. We certainly have to get beyond xenophobia. And 
we as a species are struggling to do that, right? And there, there are political aspects to this and economic aspects to this, and we have a lot to work out. But the reality of the situation is that merely opening the borders, right, given the ease of travel and given how terrible life is in various parts of the world, I would expect that if you just open the borders, if we, if we put you in charge here and we just let everyone go wherever they wanted to go, societies would reach some kind of equilibrium with respect to all of the variables that determine the quality of life in that society, which is to say that people would only stop coming to Europe or America once there was no longer a good reason to come, right? I mean, once Europe, for instance, was no better a place to live than the Middle East or North Africa. That, I think, would be the practical consequence of a true open borders policy. And that is something that terrifies someone like Douglas Murray, and for, for understandable reasons. And when you look at the specifics, when you, and again, I'm not arguing that huge disparities in wealth and political freedom are a good thing, but to merely import vast multitudes of people who don't share the values of the West, right, and are not inclined to adopt those values. And I'm not talking about everyone, obviously. There are, you know, there are people who, as you say, are fleeing theocracy, who are closeted secularists or atheists or feminists, who are aspiring scientists, who are intellectuals, who are desperate to get to places like Oxford and Cambridge, right? I'm not talking about those people, and I think those are the most important people in the world to support, whether they're coming from Iran or Eritrea or anywhere else. Uh, or Syria, obviously. But Douglas's point that he made on my podcast, and is a point that I, I can't see how you can just disparage as synonymous with bigotry, is that we know that if we just open the borders and let millions upon millions of people come into Europe from countries like Syria and Iraq and Iran and you know Muslim-majority countries, you will be importing vast numbers of people who don't share Western values, You'll be importing vast numbers of Islamists, first of all, and cons other conservative Muslims. And given the, the problems of assimilation thus far in Europe, it's hard to see how that simply makes Europe better and not a lot worse. And I'm now going to give you a chance to react to this, but I just want to finally make a point about your personal perspective as an ex-Muslim. I don't see how you can paint such a rosy picture of this, because you as an ex-Muslim have escaped theocracy. You are someone who has struggled to escape the social attitudes and even threats from Muslim men in these communities. And yet you seem to be saying that it's a sign of bigotry not to want to absorb an unlimited number of these people, even Muslim men and even Muslim men who could be guaranteed to harbor the very beliefs and attitudes that you have been trying to fight against and that you have personally escaped. That seems to be a bit of a paradox to me. It's, Please react to that. All, yeah, it's not at all a paradox. I mean, there's so much here. I, I really don't know where to start. But uh, let me try to go point by point. I mean, um, I think for me, it's because I can see people. I don't see collectives. And I think that's where we disagree with Douglas Murray, with yourselves. I don't see a collective. So for me, I don't see, you know, um, uh, you know, Muslim men or all these migrants bringing in some sort of um, culture that is inhuman and misogynist because I don't see culture as being static. I don't see it as being homogeneous. I see, you know, uh, not, not everyone in a society, even even if it is a Muslim majority country, have the same values, the same culture. There well, is. It's not very, everyone. It's no, just percentages. Exactly. So it's it, just percentages well, we're talking well, about. Well, whatever percentages, you know, whatever you want to call so it. Is, so, Islamists. So, so, I mean, so is, I let's talk a, about Islamists. I, I don't have then. a rosy picture because I, I judge people based on, you know, what they do as individuals. You know, so for me, it doesn't frighten me that there are Muslim men uh, coming in because uh, those Muslim men may also be great defenders of women's rights, you know, and uh, they're not, because for me, uh, being Muslim does not automatically mean being Muslim. It's just like being a white male does not necessarily make but, someone... But, but I'm not saying it does, but the, you know there'll if be a I, percentage of them. If I can just finish, Sam, please, if I can just finish, because there's so much you said that I 
really like to answer. Um, you know, the thing is, I think with um, the sort of perspective that Douglas Murray promotes, which is the sort of, you know, our culture and they're going to bring their culture in, I don't subscribe to this whole clash of civilizations thesis. And I I think, you know, the reality of the matter is, is there is no us and them. There are, you know, theocrats and misogynists uh, British born and European born or American born and there are atheists and secularists and free thinkers who are Iranian born or Syrian born and you know uh, therefore I, I don't subscribe to this view that if you know if you have Muslims coming in uh, and, and I put Muslims in quotes because they are not necessarily Muslims or they might be Muslim in name only they might be they there are a million ways we can define people uh, and not just um, uh, you know, uh, and also the fact that values is not, you know, not everybody has necessarily Sharia values or Islamist values. A lot of uh, people in Iran, for example, defend Western, so-called Western values, universal values, what I call universal values. You mm. know, if you look at the movement in Iran, unveiling in Iran to be unveiled because it's compulsory could end you up in prison for two months but there is a huge movement of women taking off their veils uh, you know as a sign of protest to the compulsory veiling rules you have women carrying the body of Farhonde who was killed uh, uh, when a mullah accused her of uh, you know, tearing the Quran, even though it is against Islamic customs, her family agreed with them to carry the coffin. And when one of the mullahs in the area came to pay his respects after he had said that Farhunda deserved to be killed, uh, they circled her body and said that he, he is not allowed to come to her funeral. They kicked one of the most well-known mullahs out of her funeral. So there is no us and them. There are free thinkers and women's rights campaigners in the smallest villages of Iran and Afghanistan, and there are bigots and theocrats in the biggest cities of America and, and Britain. And my point is that when you say you're defending your culture against this alien, savage, barbarian culture, there is some bigotry there because it fails to see the humanity of people. It places collective blame and equates them with the theocracies and the oppressive forces that they're fleeing. But and Marianne... I think it's important. Can I just finish? Sorry. There are many, many, many people who are languishing in prison, who are being arrested by morality police, who are um, you know, facing uh, threats and intimidation, not just great heroes like Raif Badawi or Avijit Roy, who was hacked to death in Bangladesh, just ordinary people pushing back their veil, challenging the morality police, you know, um, questioning uh, religion and dogma on Facebook. Ordinary people, ordinary, ordinary people, many of them are part of those migrants. Many of them are, are are considered the Muslim majority, and they're not. Or even if they are Muslim, they're not Islamists. And and that's why I think, you know, you know what I find ironic. Let me tell you this. What I find ironic is that um, a lot of people will criticize identity politics and they'll criticize multiculturalism and the fact that you know things are divided into various cultures. But you find that the far right and also um, uh, people like Douglas Murray, who's not on the far right, in my opinion, use a sort of white identity politics, defending my, our Europe, our, our values, our culture against the other, the brown men, the savages, you know. And I don't subscribe to that. You know, you mentioned, for example, Mark Stein or, you know, uh, before in your discussion with um, Douglas Murray, you know, and this concept of demography as destiny, uh, you know, because you do mention some what happens when there's so many Muslims in Europe or in America? And Keenan Malik has this brilliant criticism of Mark Stein where he says, well, if demography is destiny, well, then everyone should become an Islamic uh, theocracy like Iran, because in Iran, the demographics, you know, the Muslim population has decreased since an Islamic regime was established. Uh, you know, so it, it, it is sort of... 
uh, reducing things to, uh, you know, Muslims versus, you know, Europeans, enlightenment values. Keenan Malik says something else that's brilliant. He says, you know, enlightenment values is not stitched into the DNA of every single person who lives in Europe. And it's uh, just the same as Sharia is not stitched into the DNA of every person who is coming from the Middle East or North Africa or South Asia. Mm -hmm. And for me, I, I think I gain strength and courage from the fact that, you know, I see so many allies amongst Muslims. And that's why I don't feel feel that because I am an ex-Muslim, you know, I should be afraid of Muslims. Many of them are my allies. They are my friends. They have stood with me and they will stand with me. And, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, and I think it is a mistake if we buy into clash of civilizations. We fail to see the many friends we have who are deemed other. And we think that people on the far right, because they look like us, are our friends, when actually they are very similar to the theocrats that many Muslims and ex-Muslims are fighting. Okay, but yes, I do not doubt for a minute that there are millions and millions of people in Muslim-majority countries but who, it's okay to profile them, and it's okay for Douglas Murray to say our culture. Uh, well, listen, you have to and, a and no, 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 they, they Murray, Douglas doesn't even right. doubt what I'm about to say. I know Douglas as an untiring champion of Ayan Hirsi Ali. That's how we first met. It's in defending ex-Muslims that we first bonded, right? And I have no doubt that there are millions and millions of potential Mariam Namazis and Ayan Hirsi Ali's or, or actual ones in hiding in, out of necessity in Muslim-majority countries. And I've said over and over again that these are the most important people to support. And they're not in hiding, though, Sam. Oh, they're not all in hiding. Yeah, I, I mean, if it's, you read, a, it's, it's not if you important. Read Karima Benun's book on uh, your fatwa doesn't apply here. Yes. She's interviewed more than 300. They're taking, uh, some of them are taking are huge them. risks. And there's, no, yeah. there's no question. Yes, yeah. they're not all in hiding. Yeah. Right. Okay. But the, still, this Douglas's point stands here, and, I, and I've yet to hear you answer it. And it, it does come no, down. No, I, have, I have answered it, please, Sam. Please don't like my no, answer. No, no. You haven't heard. I, I, I can assure you that when hundreds of thousands of people listen to this conversation, they will say that you have not yet answered it. Okay? So well, if, that's fine. If you wanna, there if you, are others who will listen to if it. If you want a chance to answer it, let me ask the question again. Listen, please. Sam, I've just explained that I don't subscribe to the clash of civilizations. I understand that. I understand that. That Douglas that. Murray does. Okay. Okay. that you are defending. Okay, I'm not, no. It's as simple as that. I'm asking uh, you, you to cannot, answer this specific listen, question. Sam, Sam, I'm sorry, you cannot say that you support Douglas Murray's concern for our culture, white European culture. It's not white European culture. Time, it's say, value, well, it's the very it values, implies. it's that the very it values implies, that you support exactly. of secularism and tolerance exactly. and democracy so cannot, and human you rights. You cannot say that and on the other hand say that those who are coming from Muslim majority countries, no. I should be afraid of them as an ex-Muslim. No, what I'm saying no, is no, these it, two are contradictory positions this, which you are putting there forward. Is, there is no contradiction here. There is no contradiction here. in what I'm saying. There is no, the contradiction is this, okay, or, or the question you have not answered is this. And it comes down to percentages. And you're saying that you see people as individuals is not an answer to this question. I see people as individuals too. I know that there are individuals on every point of the spectrum of belief and unbelief in the Muslim world. But here is the reality of the situation. If you bring in a million people into Germany from the Middle East, some percentage of them will be Islamists, some percentage will be conservative Muslims. Let's just talk about conservative Muslims who are not inclined to assimilate. Now, my question to you is, does it matter at all what percentage that is? Is, is there a difference between living in a society where 5% of the population is conservative Muslims and 50% or 75%? Is that a difference that someone like Douglas is justified in caring about? Look, I mean, uh, Sam, I, I don't think Douglas Murray is justified, and he thinks I am not justified. We're having a discussion about our opinions, right? The fact of the matter for me is that even if someone is a conservative Muslim, it does not make them a jihadi or an Islamist. You can have people who are anti-abortion, who don't go and bomb abortion clinics. You can have people who... Please just change conservative Muslim to Islamist. Okay, just swap in that now no, and, and tell me if the per that's the problem. Um, then I'm, I'm re-asking the question. Those words there, there's a spectrum here. We're using this word slightly differently. I want to connect with your definitions. You are concerned about Islamists. 
it would seem to be rational for you to be concerned about what the percentage of Islamists actually is in any group of immigrants. But Are you concerned Saudi, about that? No, the Islamists, they might be British born, they might be American born, they might be white, they might be brown, they might be black. My concern are Islamists. And I think that if you want to target Islamism, target Islamists, target the jihadis, target the Saudi regime, the Iranian regime, target those um, Islamic organizations that are normalizing and promoting Islamism. Don't target people okay. just because of their beliefs. It's as simple as that. Okay, but is so Islamism think, is a set of beliefs, Mariam. And if, if you're in the process of vetting immigrants... It's a political movement, yeah? Because you can... Uh, this is the example I was giving. You can be... You can have a neighbor who is anti-gay and thinks that gay people are perversions, Hmm. It's very different from being part of a movement that wants gay people dead. There's a difference. Well, it's a difference we, of degree, we, yes. It's a very big difference because it's one of difference between action and belief. There is, sure. So it's the difference between inciting even hatred or hate, uh, hating someone or actually inciting violence. These are very different well, things. Still, it's a spectrum and it's people are... It's a spectrum, are, of course. It's but so, so my question to you is, we if you found that someone about... was an Islamist in the process of vetting them as a migrant, would you want them in or out as an Islamist? They haven't hurt anybody. They're not a war criminal, but they're clearly an Islamist. What Listen, do you do if, at, at if the border? It, you can, if you want to fight a political movement, you have to fight it politically. You cannot fight a political movement by banning it, by deporting people who subscribe to that movement. You have to challenge it. It's the same with the far right in, let's say, in America, the Tea Party, Trump. You can't stop him by, by, make, by silencing him. You can't stop him by deporting him to Britain or another country that likes him. Uh, you can't send him to ISIS and hope that they'll get along. You've got to challenge his ideas. Well, uh, You've got to fight him. When this argument is reduced to a question of migrant migration status, one citizenship status, what sort of papers one has, what sort of color one is, what sort of beliefs they have generally, just because they happen to unfortunately have been born in some, you know, two Muslim parents, because that is the only reason why people are considered Muslim is because they were born to Muslim parents. Then you are not dealing with the real issue, which is Islamism, which is the far right. And it's not just the Islamist far right, it is the religious far right in general, which I think the EDL, Pegida, Tommy Robinson also belong to. So for me, but again, they're not killing homosexuals. Is an I mean, important challenge. If, but if you want to keep your the distinctions that you find so important in a Muslim context stable, you have to admit that the EDL, as far right as they are, are not killing homosexuals or committing honor violence against women. Right? It's a, a huge a, difference. A, uh, Sam, that is a very, very low bar, and I'm sorry, my bar is a lot higher. Well, there are Islamists who do not decapitate that, people. That is either. the bar you use they to distinguish about, conservative they, they Muslims are, from there Islamists. Are Islamists who are considered soft Islamists. They are considered moderates. The, uh, I'm sorry, I, and, I don't and that, need and to and that's, line up okay. the heads of decapitation heads to decide whether a movement is bad for humanity or it's good for it. For me, I think if you know, if uh, the Pegida is only burning down a few asylum. Uh, centers. Well, you know, they haven't decapitated anyone. Well, I'm sorry, burning down refugee shelters is not good for me either. I don't have such a low bar on far right. I don't decide one is better just because they haven't managed to decapitate anyone. Based on that logic, we should like the Iranian well, regime because they only hang their apostates. They don't decapitate. It's the logic you just used, and it was good enough in the context of differentiating conservative Muslims from Islamists, from jihadists. My problem is the far right, the far right, okay, the religious far right. For me, Islamism and, uh, you know, you've got Breivik, for example, in Norway, who killed all those young people. Um, you know, I think if some really, you know, you've got the Hindu right in India, they're responsible for the massacre of Muslims in the Gujarat. You have the Buddhist right killing Muslims in Sri Lanka and Myanmar. These movements, yes, they're not as bad as the Islamists. I agree. They're not as bad because they don't have several states. They don't have 13 states that punishable apostates by death. They don't have Sharia right. law everywhere. But don't forget, many of our countries didn't have Sharia law 40 years ago either. Okay, but, this is a political yeah, movement first and foremost. With open and borders, it's... you have no concern that you'll wind up with... No, no Sam, I don't. I, I don't have concern because I think, you know what? I see people coming in, people who need protection, people who need safety, 
women, men, children who are fleeing the most outrageous, uh, you know, uh, v violations of rights today, whether it's the Assad regime or the or ISIS. We talk about ISIS being fascist day in and day out. We talk about how barbaric they are. They have issued fatwas against refugees, saying that refugees who leave the Islamic State are all kafirs. How dare okay. they leave an Islamic State? Okay, again, and on the other hand, we're not just they, talking about those they, people. Aren't they also ISIS? But, can't have it both Miriam, ways. again, and I, I realize now we're out of time and out of patience, but I okay. just want to make it clear, we're not just talking about those people. We're talking about truly open borders. To okay, let me say something, Sam. I, you know, let me just say this. I say treat people as individuals. If they've committed a crime, if they rape a woman in calm, prosecute them to the full extent. It doesn't matter if they are white, brown, yellow, green, if they are Muslim, Christian, atheist, prosecute them to the full extent of the law. If they are Islamists that want to impose Sharia law, if they want to blow up innocent people or even you, people who are not innocent, prosecute them to the Great, great, do great not, statement. Do just, not target Just Muslims stay there. Just stay there. Wait, 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 Miriam. You can't prosecute people for Islamism. You just said this. You can't deport Donald Trump, right? You have to fight prosecute ideas with them. ideas. I didn't say deport, prosecute. If they've committed a crime, you, prosecute them. Okay, but you if can't prosecute Islamists. Crime, you challenge can't. them, challenge them, challenge what them. What do you do at the border with an Islamist? You challenge ideas, you challenge far right. Should, should Islamists be free to immigrate wherever they want to in Europe? Look, the thing is that when you uh, when you agree on fundamental human rights, you, you her rights are for people you hate, you despise. If you are against torture, you are against the torture of some lovely left wing communist person like myself, and you are against the torture of some despicable Islamist jihadi in Guantanamo. If you agree that torture is wrong, in the same way, the right to asylum. If the person is conservative, if they are not secular, if they are anti-gays, if they are anti-women, the very fact that they need refugee and protection, but, they have certain But we're not just rights. talking about asylum. We're talking about mi mere yeah. migration. So migration, it, whatever. So Islamists. Listen, uh, so, uh, Sam, I wouldn't worry. Let, trust me. The borders are so closed. The, there is such a fortress up there that for every one person that enters, there are hundreds of thousands who are not able to. I, I wouldn't uh, be so concerned. What I would say is that for every person that comes in who is a jihadi, who should be prosecuted for crimes against humanity, there are hundreds of thousands of people who just want to live in a society where yes. they can breathe. We agree that Islamism and theocracy is so vile. You know, a little compassion for people fleeing it is the least that one okay. can expect, especially again, of atheists but Mariam, who but, are so critical but, of religion but, all the time. But Mariam, the, again, this this <laughs> leaves out the crucial truth, which is, again, you're, you're castigating someone like Douglas for focusing on. I have no problem with Douglas Murray. I am talking about his politics. I'm sure he's a lovely person. Every time I've met him, he's been nothing but charming. But my point is, I'm not talking about an individual. I'm talking about a certain type of politics that sees this as a clash of civilizations. I see so many allies amongst those who are trying to enter Europe, who are Muslims, who are migrants. I, and I know that many of them are fleeing because they want to breathe free. Many of them have taken risks. Many of them just want to live 21st century lives, which is impossible under an Islamic theocracy, yes. under ISIS. I feel nothing but solidarity with those people. I just have one final right. question for you. Right. What, what right. percentage of the Muslim community do you sorry, think? I'm sorry, I don't know. Don't you don't know. know. But don't can know, can you guess? I mean, we're talking about 5% no, or 95%? Sam, I don't know. Look, the thing is, look, because, you know, many, look, don't forget that if you look at pictures of Iran or Afghanistan 30 years ago, you wouldn't recognize it today. You know that. Yes, I do know that. Okay, so this is not because of people's culture. It's because Islamism has just come and bulldozed over those societies and imposed the niqab, imposed the veil, imposed Sharia law. But you seem to have no concern of that happening killed. in London. No, I don't have concern. How many times am I supposed to tell you? I, I'm concerned about the Islamists. I'm not concerned about people. I'm no. not concerned about people. Okay. I'm concerned about the Islamists. But you're not concerned, concerned about, the about the Islamists in London. But, but I'm concerned about an Islamist in Iran, uh, in, in the Saudi government, as well as on the streets of London. I'm concerned with it all. I see it as a global political movement that is 
killing and slaughtering people. And most of the people they're killing are people in the Middle East and North Africa and South Asia. They are slaughtering. In Iran, they have slaughtered an entire generation. Yes, There are but... countless people buried in mass graves. I am concerned about this movement. Okay, but what is? But, but we all I'm are. Saying, okay. What's so frustrating is that you're not acknowledging how open borders no. interacts unhelpfully with that concern. Because I don't equate people, Muslims, migrants with Islamists in the same way that every white male I see is not a neo-Nazi fascist to me. I'm like that. I make those distinctions between people, individuals, and political movements. And that is the fundamental basis of my politics. Human rights for everyone, including people I don't agree with, you know, uh, criticizing I, I, I agree with that too with unequivocally far-right fascist movements, whether they are fascists that we like because they criticize um, Islam and Islamism, or fascists, and, and there are people, uh, the regressive left, who like Islamists and will side with them. Uh, I'm against all fascists, all types of fascists. They don't necessarily have to have decapitated anyone for me not to like them and to oppose them. And for me, I defend people. You can be Muslim, atheist, brown, yellow, black. You have rights, whether I like your opinions or not. If you have committed a crime, if you have raped, if you are going to commit a terrorist atrocity. And uh, how do we know jihadi, that? I oppose you. I oppose you. But you fight that movement politically because it's a political movement, not by scapegoating, not by profiling, not by basing collective blame on masses of people, many of them who are resisting but, this movement. So you're too. saying you cannot fight it politically by maintaining your borders. That is an illegitimate tool to use in the political fight against the spread of Islamism. Sam, look, we, the borders are defended. Well, you don't think they so should. Much. They're, they're, you don't think they should be. That's what I'm trying to understand well, in your position. No, listen, that's not true, and I've explained that a, a million times. You know, the fact that I say borders should be open doesn't mean that you know uh, tanks of jihadis can just roll in, and you've got to stand there and twiddle your thumbs while they roll in. No one's talking people. about tanks. I'm just saying. Well, well, I'm just saying. I'm just giving an example. I'm saying open borders for people. That doesn't mean there's a vetting process. That doesn't mean. What do you do when you discover they're Islamists? I've asked you this question several them. different ways. Prosecute you can't them. Prosecute pro you them. can't prosecute someone for their beliefs. You're the first to make that point. You no, can't you uh, can't prosecute an Islamist for Islamism. No, you can prosecute an Islamist if they are imposing Sharia law. If they I'm talking are... about someone who's immigrating or is attempting to immigrate into Europe from one of these Muslim majority societies and you challenge them, you fight them politically. That's what I do all the so, time. So I you bring them. OK, but again, born in Britain, this is this is all this is this is a needlessly confusing point. But I, again, I still don't understand your position here. And I, 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 I promise you this is the last question, but I've asked this several different ways. You must still bring them into Europe and then wait to prosecute them, right? Listen, or find some basis to prosecute them. Look, I didn't say bring them in. Look, this is the question. When when people are against um, the coming in of migrants and refugees, they'll say that these are all bogus and uh, they want genuine refugees. Well, the only way you can determine genuine refugees are a refugee is someone, by definition, legally, who has left their home country and who has come to either a bordering country or a country of third asylum to apply for refugee status. So they have already left their country. They can, therefore, there is no determination on whether they are genuine or bogus by the very fact that they have fled. Where that determination is made is once they have arrived, then there is asylum uh, procedures, whether it's in the US or Britain, or there is refugee processing in a country like Turkey by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. So refugees flee, they come they register, they are interviewed, they are vetted, they are processed. That has been the way it has worked for decades. That is how you determine who is a refugee and who isn't. When you advocate that people can't even enter into a border, your concern is really not bogus versus genuine refugees. You just don't want people to come. You have to let people to people enter a okay. safe haven but, but what do you in do? order to then be... What do you do once you vet them as Islamists? 
Well, you vet them. In the U.S., for example, if you are known to have committed a war crime, if you no, have... No, they uh, haven't committed, committed a war crime. They have a belief system that they articulate, okay. which is... If we, they have a belief system that has not violated anyone's rights, that has not been involved with killing civilians no, But they w they Syria. want to live under Sharia law. Okay, it, well... Listen, you know, p lots of people believe in lots of ridiculous things, and they can be very reasonable to some. Uh, I think some atheists have very ridiculous assertions on certain things. A lot of people think, I am completely ridiculous. That's part of the fact that we don't all think the same. It's very normal that we don't. I think we cannot determine who has rights based on whether we like them or whether we agree on them. People have rights even if we don't like them, even if we disagree with them, even if we find their views vehement. And that's the difference. What, you know, if no crime has been committed, you're going to have, in the same way that in Britain, we have people who are conservative, who think that, uh, you know, who are, who are Christian, who think that gay people are deviants, who are opposed to gay marriage who are opposed to abortion and, yes. you know, women's right to choose. Yes. You know, I can't say that, you know, you can't access health care because I don't like the fact that you're a Christian, you know, fundamentalist. Because that's a right, the right to health care, okay. the right to food, the right to education, the right to shelter, and the right to asylum. The fact that the right to asylum is not recognized as a basic human right by many people doesn't mean that it isn't one. And the fact that there are so many people who are demanding it, who need it, uh, you know, uh, yes. and, and it is a recognized right, actually, if you look okay, at the Okay, but UN again, now, you, now you're talking about the more narrow condition of asylum seekers as it's opposed to... It's not so narrow because it's based, it's political opinion, race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group. This is a very, very yes. broad category. And I would argue that anyone fleeing from a place like Iran, a place from Syria. If you look at, you know, 91% of the refugees in the world are coming from the top 10 refugee producing countries. They are real reasons why they are fleeing. No you doubt. You cannot, on the one hand, you know, be an advocate against theocracy and Islamism and talk about how bad it all is. And then on the other hand, uh, then say, you know, well, uh, the people who are fleeing it don't deserve to have a better okay. life and we, a different type of yes, life and uh, protection. Uh, the problem is other. many of them are not, as we know, based on failures of assimilation thus far for several generations, matter, we know okay, they're look, not fleeing those values. It's not true. It, it's not true. Uh, Muslims in this country were not even labeled Muslim several decades ago. They were called Asians. They were very much at the forefront of left-wing organizing around trade unions and anti-racist work. What happened in the past few decades as a result result of multiculturalism, entire communities and societies have been marked with only one identity, and that is Muslim. And we've also seen the rise of the Islamist movement, which has helped in doing that because it feigns to represent all Muslims. And let's not forget that U.S. foreign policy, for example, during the Cold War, it was part of U.S. foreign policy to create a green belt and Islamic belt around the Soviet Union at the time, the Mujahideen, the Taliban. There is a history of supporting the and arming the Islamists when they were not even mainstream. And now suddenly it's become our culture. They were not even part of our culture. They were in the, they were in the periphery. If you look at the Iranian revolution, it was a left-leaning revolution. The great powers including the U.S., they met at, in Guadalupe. It was called the Guadalupe Conference. They decided that they prefer an Islamic state there because it was it fit the strategy during the Cold War. And now suddenly, 30 years on, it's become our culture. You know, wait for another 30 years and ISIS will be people's culture in Syria because that's what happens. When the oppressor writes history, they will determine what, you know, uh, people think and how people think. And the resistance will completely be ignored or annihilated. That is the reality of the histories of many of our countries. You know, 30, 40 years ago, nobody wore a ch black chador in Iran. The burqa, it was on... No one had seen, uh, you know, these black sort of niqabs in many countries in Mali. A lot mm. of these dresses have now, over, you know, this sort of niqab and burqa have overtaken the national dress. They say this is the Islamic custom. This is the local dress. It's not. It's taken over from people's local dresses, the shalwar kameez, the, the very colorful sort of 
uh, boo-boos that women in Mali, for example, where it's completely annihilated that, taken that over, give it 10, 20 years, suddenly it's become our culture. You know, Douglas Murray is concerned about, you know, us coming and overtaking, you know, European culture, whereas in fact, you know, it, it, what, what that sort of uh, perspective fails to see is that this is a political movement. It has bulldozed over our societies. The reason we're fleeing is because we have no options to flee, that there is very little choice involved and that uh, not necessarily people fleeing um, are people who uh, agree with the oppressors there and also you know if you look at what I think is a tsunami of atheism in the Middle East and North Africa, it, it is a backlash. There is a huge backlash against the Islamists, whether it's the unveiling movement in Iran, whether it is the young people in, uh, for example, um, Morocco and Tunisia defying fasting rules and going and having a picnic during Ramadan when they can be prosecuted and they are beaten by the police and jailed for doing so. There is a huge backlash as well. Mm -hmm. And many of those people are part of that backlash too. And that's why I say target the political movement, target the Christian right, the Islamic right, the Buddhist right, the Hindu right. Don't target Hindus, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists. Okay. Well, I will have to let that stand. I'm not sure we understand one another any better, but um, I thank you for attempting it, and um, I hope to meet you under um, more relaxed circumstances at some other point, Miriam. I, I'm very, I, I, I'm really grateful that we had this conversation. I feel very relaxed, actually, Sam. I, I think it's an important discussion to have. I think we, we, you know, it's the reality is that even very reasonable people will disagree. I think this is a saying someone, someone brilliant has said, I don't know who it is, but uh, that it is often possible for reasonable people to disagree yes, with each that, other. That, that is true. And, I was afraid at the beginning of this conversation, and I remain uh, worried that you think we disagree far more than we do, and that there's just a fair amount of confusion still in the air, but I will let our listeners sort it out. Okay, thank uh, you. So, thank you to the listeners for trudging along. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Finally, is it, where can people find out more about you online? Give us your Twitter oh. handle and, and oh, all the yeah. rest. Oh, uh, yeah. So um, if they go on to uh, www.mariamnamazi.com, that's my website, and also Twitter is at Mariam Namazi. And of course, um, there are so many campaigns I work on, like the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, uh, which is founded to break the taboo that comes with leaving Islam, or the One Law for All campaign against Sharia law in Britain. I, for example, have uh, started a campaign called Fitna because, um, uh, you know, the Islamists think we are, women are the source of fitna and chaos in society. We're calling ourselves that. And we, we say basically that we are Islamism's worst nightmare. Uh, I've also done things like nude protest, uh, you know, because the Islamists hate us so much. They want us covered and, you know, disappeared basically from the public space. Um, nude protest can be seen as a form of challenge to this sort of, you know, very misogynist view of women. So there's lots of different things um, that maybe if we weren't stuck on this profiling and immigration issue, we could have talked about. But I do think profiling and immigration are hugely important, particularly amongst atheists, this conversation we need to have a lot of. So thank you for giving me that opportunity to do that. Thanks for coming on. And uh, my best to uh, your friend Dia, who um, I believe is filming you during this conversation. Until next time, Miriam, thanks for your time. Okay, I will let you all do a post-mortem on that. Uh, I could not shake the fact that there was an impressive talking past one another there that I could never quite seem to correct for. Um, no doubt some of the fault is mine. Uh, you should all know that some of the fault is, is also Skype. There's a delay in Skype. And when you try to interrupt somebody, the delay makes those attempted intrusions seem far more hostile or urgent. This is an imperfect technology. But um, all I can say is I tried. Now I'm going to go do something else. Perhaps a nude protest. If you enjoyed this podcast, there are several ways you can support it. You can leave reviews on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you happen to listen to it. You can share it on social media with your friends. 
You can discuss it on your own blog or podcast, or you can support it directly, and there are two ways you can do this. You can leave a donation through my website at samharris.org forward slash donate, or you can try a membership at Audible, the world's leading source of audiobooks, at audibletrial.com forward slash samharris.